Public transit, should it be free? This is a, a somewhat interesting and niche uh, discussion. I think that a lot of times uh, you you hear relatively simplistic arguments. You'll hear like progressives on Twitter saying, um, well, it should be free because it's publicly subsidized. And there's oftentimes like almost like this sort of vague moral argument that, you know, people should be able to travel and this and that. And, you know, we, we should just have these things be free. Um, but then you'll have a, a less than nuanced alternative discussion where it's like, should we even have public transit? No, we should charge for it. Congestion pricing, you know, we should run public transit like fucking Uber or something, right? Um, which is not particularly nuanced as well. And so um, broad overview, let's start with Micah. Micah's probably looked into this the most since he's the most urban local institution pilled of the three of us. Uh, Micah, to the question, should public transit be free at the point of service. I am a citizen of the city, therefore I can use public transit as much as I want. Is that how it should be? Why or why not? So in the world in which we live, in the United States, the answer is no. Um, this is something that's been discussed a lot in the city of Houston, and there's been um, a lot of exploration about the idea. And the conclusion seems to consistently be that if our goal is increasing ridership of public transit, and reducing reliance on automobiles, uh, what we should be we should be spending every dollar on improving the quality of our public transportation system. That means making it more frequent, making it more enjoyable, making it get to destinations faster, and expanding its scope so that you can really get around the city um, being car free. Um, while it it is nice to pay an even lower amount to use public transit, it's usually it's it's a quite low amount today. Um, it just isn't the case that uh, that money is best spent on making it even cheaper than it currently is. And there is an unintended negative consequence of making it free. Um, it's that people who are homeless um, tend to just house themselves within mass transit. Now, this is a very unfortunate thing. I'm sure that homeless people don't like to have to, to do this. They'd prefer to be housed. And that certainly would be the ideal solution. But in uh, our cities where we have not solved the homelessness crisis, moving all of the homeless people or a large percentage of them onto mass transit will surely substantially decrease ridership and reduce the quality of the experience. This is something that's already happened um, on Houston's public transportation network, where our light rail very frequently does not actually enforce its own fares. And so you can see people will sit on there the entire day and it can pose a safety risk and discomfort to people who are riding as actual commuters. Okay, and Estia, what are your thoughts? I mean, I, I think intuitively there's some obvious reasons to go in either direction. One is that if it's free, like there's just a democratic sort of, uh, you know, maybe egalitarian approach to that. Like it's, this is the transport owned by the people. Everyone gets to use it. We all pay for it. We all use it. Um, one other benefit is that you then, you don't need to have stuff that involves payment transaction. Like every machine that needs to manage cash, every machine that needs to manage cards, all the infrastructure just goes away. There's just a guy on a bus and you get on the bus. Um, so, you know, there's some cost saving related to that, even though most of the costs associated with riding, you know, it, that's got to be like 1% of the, the overhead of running a bus service, 2%. Uh, most of it's labor cost and bus cost or, you know, the, the train cost. So minimal, but real. Um, there's benefits in terms of ridership if you make it free. Something that I feel is under discussed is that, you know, when you get in a car, it doesn't feel like you're paying a cost. But you are like your car is depreciating. You're paying for gas or electricity or whatever, and so you just don't think about that. And so mentally, that's a problem for when you want to charge something to someone upfront. There's a big difference between paying a quarter for something and paying nothing for something. One is oh, I got to get my wallet out, and it's this whole, it's this whole, it's just this thing in your in your head that makes you not want to do it. And if you get rid of that, more people are willing to do it, and they might be more willing to switch away from cars. So there's a real tangible benefit there. The costs are like Micah said, you can have public safety concerns. Um, I think there, there's also concerns. The most obvious one is that if you are actually strapped for cash, if this is the people's bus, but the people, the people don't actually want to pay for it, then you might have really shitty service. So you might have really infrequent headways. That means a bus might only come instead of every five minutes, it might be every 15, maybe every 25. And then no one really cares how cheap the bus is because yeah, they can get on for no cost, but they've got to wait 25 minutes. And that also sucks. So, you know, if there's a trade off between frequency of headways and cost of service, um, you, there's some balance between those. Um, 
Now, that, of course, assumes that people aren't willing to pay for everything. So maybe if we live in a more lefty society, if we pass all of Joe Biden's wonderful uh, tax proposals and we have another trillion dollars to throw at the problem, maybe it's not such an issue. But um, I, I feel like the argument is just very simple. Your, your goal is to try and maximize bus usage, train usage over car usage because it reduces the amount of wear and tear on the roads. It reduces the amount of cost to society, reduces fossil fuel usage. There's a lot of benefits to public transit. So you want to do so however possible. And if that means you have to charge some people to increase the amount of money so that you can run buses more often, then you do it. Like, I, Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I, I kind of, I, I sit in a, a somewhat open-minded, I guess, place with regards to this question. Like, should public transit be free? I think that I, I lean a little bit more towards what SDL said, at least at the very beginning, which is that there's certainly intuitive reasons and like practical reasons to prefer either one. But I feel like either either problem, like what Micah mentioned, oh, you know, a bunch of homeless people might be sort of crowding the, you know, the subway or the bus station or whatever it is, um, you, you know, like simple enforcement of that kind of thing, uh, I, I think is, is pretty feasible. Like I, at least at the very least, like when I hear about these problems in New York where, you know, oh, in New York, we got all these homeless people and mentally ill people uh, in the subway system and it's unsafe. Um, it seems like the general response to that is just to try and increase like security presence and enforcement um, of um, of subways and things like that. Um, and I guess the question would be like, is that is that is, is the trade off of that better or worse than the trade off that SDL mentioned of having all this extra infrastructure for you know cards and payment of those systems and is it even the case that that infrastructure prevents homeless people from doing the same thing anyway? Like you said, Micah, people just don't like the fees just aren't enforced anyway. Right. So like, is the problem really solved by having a user fee? Um, and so if the question is ultimately, how do we enforce this? It seems like it could be a problem either way. The reading that I've done makes me lean towards a general goal of free at the point of service public transit. Um, part of the stuff that I've read that makes me lean towards that general goal is that, um, number one, like SDL said, public transit usage just tends to increase when it's free versus very low cost. And uh, intuitively, right, like I want people to use public transit. I don't want people to just not use it and use cars instead because it's bad for the environment. Some people will say, well, uh, you're congesting public transit, like a lot more people are using it, which strains the system. My response to that's very simple. Obviously, just expand the services offered. If a lot of people are using it, that's a good problem to have um, in the sense that there's a lot of people that want to use public transit. Um, and number two, for every person that you cram onto a bus, that's, you know, that that's one less car on the road. So you're decreasing public road congestion, right? So there's obviously almost a one for one trade off there, which I think is important to understand. Another thing that I've read is that it seems like the health benefits of public transit usage are pretty positive, not only in the sense that there's less air pollution because less people are in cars, but also the fact that people have to walk to the train station or the bus stop, right? There's just more physical activity involved with using, you know, public transit instead of just walking out to your driveway and getting in your car. And that's something that's worth sort of pricing into um, the alternatives of either one. Um, I will say that... <clears throat> I, I will say that I probably disagree with SDL. I think the difference between like low cost, high exemption public transit is probably not extreme relative to just totally free public transit. Like, yes, there's additional administrative costs, but the actual things that I'm mentioning, like the health effects and the effects on congestion and usage are probably not that extreme. Like, for instance, right, the city where we have totally free public busing and a subway system and a transit line versus those same systems where it costs $30 a month and you can have corporate partnerships for lower costs for employees and students are exempt and children are exempt and parents with children are exempt and el the elderly are exempt from, from paying. That's probably not a big difference in usage between those two and the health outcomes, right? So, you know, if there's actually a real utility of the fee, like maybe it could make some sense. Like if the political capital just doesn't exist for totally free, but you can, you can argue for the second system, I mean, just go for the second system. That's way better anyway. So that's kind of where I sit. Um, well, STL, it seems like just, you have something to say. Yeah, go for it. Just to speak to those those two things, I think you're right. You know, if it's politically feasible, you just do, you have to do what's politically feasible to maximize usage. Um, 
just sort of relating it back to the tax system we had before, all of us sort of pine for, well, what if we just had one big, simple tax? We don't like having all these little tax instruments, which are like, well, our tax system's quarter sucks here. So what if we sort of shore up over here and that causes a distortion? So we sort of shore up over there, you know, just one big fee w- yep. or just totally free is sort of nice in that respect. I just wanted to mention on the air pollution thing before we got too far away from it, there are 40,000 deaths per year from um, transportation related air pollution in this country. We don't think about it, but you know, Cars kill 40,000 people in car accidents or car crashes, really, because almost all of them are due to human error. But they also kill an additional 40,000 people, cars and trucks, just by shitting shit into our lungs. Like, you are the storage place for a decent amount of air pollution in this country, and that kills you. And that's bad. So, like, I, I don't know. I just Yeah, and the mechanism for that cost. is... It sounds weird, but the mechanism for that is that it, you know, it, it marginally increases a population's propensity towards certain things. Like, for instance, if you get COVID... And you also have, let's say, a pre-existing sort of respiratory infection because of polluted air. Well, you're probably much more likely to die from COVID, right? And so all of these things sort of add to your 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 chances of dying for any particular thing if you have polluted air. It's not necessarily that you walk outside and you immediately collapse from you know the general amount of pollution in the air. It just adds on that one extra tick for your probability of dying from any one thing that you know could be confounded from the polluted air that you exist in uh, typically speaking i mean obviously in some cities maybe you do just collapse from how poor quality the air is but not generally the case micah go for it yeah yeah so i I really think that probably the correct verdict to take is that it's just going to depend a lot on where you're at uh, when it comes to your mass transit system right so like in a city like houston the frequency is like pretty bad um all over the place and the scope of the system is pretty bad and the quality of the experience is, is not very good either. And so here we absolutely need to be improving quality because we just know from all the studies that I've seen, that is the determinant. It's not the cost. People are not choosing to not go use Houston's public transit system because it's too expensive. It's already remarkably cheap. So it just doesn't get them where they need to go on time. And they got to sit at a bus stop for a super long time. Who likes to do that in this hot weather? Now, if you are a city that has a lot of like fixed infrastructure, I'm talking about like light rail, metro, such that there is going to be a certain frequency that's always maintained. There's a certain supply and there's just not enough people in those seats. There's tons of la- like s- empty unused supply. Then it probably is worth it uh, to make it free or cheaper than it is today uh, because you're probably not making that much money from these fares because barely anybody's using it. It's going to be there. You can't re- reduce your um, service frequency. So you might as well have reduce the price of so more people are using it. Uh, right now. I think that, one thing that I think we all agree on is that you should not be paying uh, per use of the public transit system generally. We should move to a system where people are paying more monthly installments, like a subscription fee. Uh, it seems like a lot of places already have this, but like whenever you're, whenever there's no marginal cost to using transit every single time you do it, that reduces your transaction cost, you know, trying to find your card, uh, but also just makes the experience a lot more enjoyable. Hey, I know that I can always take the bus anywhere I need to go because I paid $120 this year. So I have unlimited access. And so I think you paid for your bus prime subscription, right, Micah? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right. And so like the question is, should it be low or should it be free? And I think in the United States, it should be low. Uh, it should not be free. But I can imagine there's certain environments. Maybe you solved homelessness. Maybe you have tons of fixed supply infrastructure of transit where making it free could be appropriate or even a, for certain periods of the day. Imagine like it's late in the evening, right? You got all the trains are still running. You know, you want to make sure people are not drunk driving. Okay, make it free then. I, that that can make a lot of sense to me. Yeah, administratively, that wouldn't be obviously very complex. You know, the, the you just turn off cycle. the system at six. It's like that easy. <laughs> yeah, or you could just stop checking for cards or whatever it is. Right, it's just not a big deal at a certain yeah. point. Um, because I mean the the enforcement. Like I remember going to Montreal at one point and. Um, it was, you know, each each of the buses just had a scanner. The scanner was just the card that you were given as part of your your fee. Um, I believe local universities had their uh, student ID cards integrated with the same system. So you could just scan your card. There you go. If you didn't scan your card, you just try to walk in like an asshole. Well, the bus driver would say, uh, you know, uh, excuse me, good sir. Uh, you did not scan anything. And I'm going to need you to leave or I'm going to call the Mounties on you. And that's pretty much how it was enforced, right? So it's not exactly a incredibly difficult, like, administratively complex system. And I don't really know. I mean, Micah, you'd probably know more about me. Like, I don't know how 
I, 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 it doesn't seem like there's as much of this sort of like federal, like a lot of people worry about things like this because in the federal government, Republicans actually literally try to make administrative efficiency worse in, in like all aspects of government service. I haven't seen that as much at the local level, at least like when I when I see politicians talking about things and ideas, it's basically always motivated. How do we deliver city services in the cheapest, most efficient way? Now, some ideas are worse than others, but there doesn't seem to be like a motivation to make city services worse, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Um, well, they, they just don't want to spend money on them, right? Just as you right, said, right? right? Like with the Houston Metro, Republicans look at ways to just take as much money from it as possible. Um, largely, arguably illegally, because the Metro has a designated retail sales tax that voters voted for, that it, that it takes a certain amount of tax. And I think th this relates to probably a separate topic we could talk about at some point. Uh, but like for public transportation, probably the, in the ideal wonk world, it would be something that's like fare free with a designated land value tax, uh, because the land value tax will capture um, the the effect that the public transit has on local land values, such that the system could be uh, in in a large way really self sustaining still, uh, because you know it's it's capturing the value that it's adding. Uh, one other thing I should note though because I know my neoliberal friends will be uh, find this frustrating, is that whenever you subsidize public services, um, their private alternatives are put at a systematic and unfair disadvantage. So if we have some really innovative idea, innovative way to provide private mass transit, um, such as the company SeatsX or like, you know, Uber variants but are, that are actually using a more mass transit oriented model, um, they're not gonna be able to compete with free. Who can compete with free? Right, that they'd have to have a huge benefit in their quality of service in order to better compete with that, and so that that would be a concern that I'd have um, with the free model, basically making it such that there's really no incentive for private firms to um, really compete. Now, what you could say is, what if we incorporate private providers into the public system? That'd be something I'm I'm open minded about, but I think that that argument is worth acknowledging. I don't know. I mean. Yeah, I was going to say, like, I don't know how resonating that argument is because, like, there's so, there's so many local governments that have so, there's so many different public transit systems. There's got to be thousands of different public transit systems in this country, um, some privately run, some publicly run. I feel like from a city level, um, almost almost like behaviorally, it makes sense that you could argue for a purely public system. And if the argument is, well, what about innovation? It's like, well, I mean, we can look at all the thousands and thousands and thousands of different public transit systems that are privately and publicly run in other cities. Like, we don't need to have a private sort of alternative um, because we have all of these other examples and models that we can draw from. I don't know if we really need like a local production of of private well, models. We're talking about, I think we're talking about a model that we, we'd like for cities. We're not talking about just one city. I think we're talking about generally what we want from cities, right? And, you know, it usually cities are not great innovators for pretty much anything because to innovate, you need scale and specialization. So if we ever were to see a huge breakthrough in how like, private production and mass transit, it would probably be some like huge startup firm like with ridiculous amounts of money and gobs and gobs of spending on research that like actually produced this and in order for that to be supported there would have to be a marketplace for it there had to be cities where this could actually make money right and so like if our model was in place where it was free in all the cities you know that would be that basically make any sort of firm starting up in that area pretty much yeah. impossible I, I guess generally i would just say that i don't I don't I don't take it to be the case that even if we generally recommended a fully public transit system, uh, because we because ultimately we're always recommending a decentralized public transit system. I mean, obviously, maybe there's some, you know, maybe there's some public infrastructure projects on a federal or state level, like maybe like big tr uh, train lines and things like this. Maybe if you have a very small state like Rhode Island or something like you could have a, a state bus system or something like that. Um, but you know, I would say, I would just say generally you, you could recommend because it's a decentralized system, a decentralized public system, and just generally trust the idea that, well, New York's probably going to operate their subway a little bit differently than the other subways across all the other worlds. And, you know, we can compare the innovation of the public sector to the innovation of any potential alternative, you know, private sector or contract or something like that. I guess I'm just generally saying, 
I'm not totally against like private options for public transit, obviously, you know, if we had private management or, you know, some, some socialists recommend worker management of public transit, like it should be cooperatively owned or something, but um, not necessarily against stuff like that. Um, I'm just saying, I, I think you could, you could still rely on a lot of like model innovation from uh, just the public system. Like for instance, if we were to compare like, I don't know, uh, you know, public universities to each other or something like, you know, the modes of instruction and stuff like that aren't totally radically different from one university to another. But I think there's a lot of room for experimentation there that does happen. You can just cross apply any gains from one system to another uh, pretty easily. But anyway, Estelle, what were you going to say? I mean, I was just going to say that um, there have been experiments with like taxi systems, like Mike was talking about, where the goal is to try and focus on rather than one person in one destination, multiple people, in, in, you know, in one car to another area. Um, and you know, to some degree, that that is probably actually worth subsidy. Like it just incorporating, I would love to see, unironically, some sort of city planner somewhere is like, here's the transit line that all these people would be taking to work. Could we pay them to carpool? Could we pay a company to get these people to carpool or something along those lines? Um, because like, there's a lot of benefits to be had there of just driving one car versus four or whatever. Um, so like, I, I don't know, I, you're probably right that stuff like that should be incorporated. It is just a, a it, it is much harder to run a let's micromanage people's commute to work versus let's just run a service where people can get on and off whenever. Um, well, yeah, and, and that's why really, um, if you wanted to have a level playing field, you probably wouldn't introduce much in the way of like normal subsidies at all. You would just tax congestion a lot, like you'd have sure. tolls, and then you could have some sort of voucher model or a basic income, and then you just like let you know the market go crazy. Now, the, the concern has always been the politics of that, and also the administration of actually pricing road use, which is like you know you need to have your carbon tax, uh, you need to have probably some sort of extra pollution tax, just because yeah. that there's an external cost there in terms of people's air quality. And then you need the road damage, right? Then you need the market-based pricing of road use. There's a lot. There's a lot of administrative difficulties to actually having that occur. And there's, I mean, no, the fact just that congestion like pricing. You, sorry, go ahead, please, Economy. Kind of it's like what you said earlier, Micah, as well. The fact that, like, if we were to implement all those policies in a city like Houston, where we don't have very high-quality public transit the politics become even worse, right? Because it's like, well, damn, like you're taxing all my car usage. But like the reason I use a car in Houston isn't because I'm some like evil person that just hates the poor on public transit. Public transit in Houston sucks. That's why I use a car in Houston, right? So you're kind of just taxing me and not giving me a great alternative. So the great alternative should probably come first, similar to how like the question of should well, it be free or not? Well, when we have a quality transit system, that conversation becomes a lot easier. And it's worth noting that to some degree, when you give people that alternative, they just switch automatically. There have been interesting studies looking at the introduction of Uber and other costs, like basically ride sharing platforms, and they do actually reduce new car purchases and increase car sales and stuff. So like, I haven't seen studies on that with expansion of public transit, but I would assume the effect would be very, very similar. Like, Don't show that study the to the libertarians. I, I I'll have, I'll I never have let us live it down. I have many friends which literally don't have a car in this city. And they're they're in college, right? And they get around exclusively using Uber. Wow! Right? I, I have <laughs> I have many remarkable. rich friends, says Micah. <laughs> no, really, no, not even all of them are rich. Some of them are literally migrant students. Like one of my friends is from Libya. <laughs> that's how she gets around. Like it's really remarkable. But that's I don't know how she affords it. But Godspeed to her. <laughs> Goodness. Um, I, I did just want to say something that that has interested me a lot is that. Um, recently, I've been thinking about how a lot of American government functions are way more decentralized than they are in other countries. So our cops in this country are almost all run by the city. Our transit is almost always run by the city. And other countries will sometimes scale it up quite a bit. So some countries will have cops run by the federal government. You know, you'll just have a hierarchical system going all the way down. The reason I've been thinking about this is that there's some evidence that local elections are way more biased towards the rich, the old, the white, the conservative. And so part of me wonders, part of the reason why there's bad politics on this, same as for turning out to zoning meetings or whatever. When you go to a zoning meeting, it's all people who have a bunch of free time on their hand and really care about local land values. And who is that? It's the old people with no job or who have a shit ton of free time who really care about not letting any new housing in their area. And so these are just a terrible way to govern zoning. And in my opinion, it's probably a terrible way to govern like policing or public transit because who's turning out to city council meetings? Not the guy who's waiting on the bus. It's the guy who's got the car and a bunch of free time. And so uh, 
basically, I've just wondered if moving these to a state system might unironically not be a more democratic and open up more of the political options that we're talking about to just having like free month, just having maybe a monthly tax payment or a monthly sales tax. Um, I guess not monthly sales, a, a sales tax that is earmarked for this. Um, I wonder if those would be opened up by moving to a state system, stabilizing local public transit. I mean, I think we organize at the county level in the state of Texas. I think that's like, it seems pretty appropriate. It's just like our hospital system, it's, it's organized just because like, you know, one bus route is a pretty delicate thing. Like you really need to understand where the stop is. You need to understand the conditions on the ground. It seems to me relatively difficult for a state level agency to have that kind of like that much intricate administrative labor tasked to it for every city. I mean, city why not? Hires. Like if you just merge tomorrow, the, the public transit authority in Houston and in Austin, and they have their two offices in two different cities and they keep doing the exact same work. I, I'm just, you know, I, I guess I'm sort of, maybe I'm, I'm less skeptical of the idea of public of central planning, this kind of thing, but it just seems like you would just keep doing the same work. Right. Well, I, I suppose if you keep doing the same work, I guess, I guess you, you'd have like some sort of state appointment process for the leaders of all the metros, right? Uh, which, which in Texas would mean they're Republicans. <laughs> sure. Um, and sure. <laughs> uh, I guess you, the one benefit is you could have some like state level research on best practices. So you can maybe have like cross commercialization of best business practices. So I think that's cool. So long as like good people are elected at the state level. So maybe in, maybe in blue states, may, maybe we could do that there. <laughs> Yeah, I just I did wonder state. about stuff like, you know, like when Economo was talking about, oh, they've got ID card integration. Well, why not just have like a national system? You can get on any bus anywhere and there's one fee system and all the state systems just have some fee structure built into like bus.gov or train.gov or whatever. And so, you know, they, this one charges a dollar, this one charges zero, but it's all part of the same system. It doesn't seem like that should be, you know, that's not too hard to do. Uber is doing stuff like that at scale right now. Uh, if only if only we lived in a sane country where we could do relatively easy good ideas. Sure. Fair yeah. enough. Yeah, unfortunately I think that America just has so many just like so many political constraints. Uh like both constitutionally and uh you could say like attitudinally with regards to sort of federal management of things. Um I mean the FBI is already controversial enough, much less having like a federal sort of ground level police force. Um Obviously, in I mean, in Texas, we have state police, right? And there is, um, as far as I'm aware, there's like state subsidization for uh, forms of transit. That's why I say, like, I think that there are certain forms of public transit where I think that bigger entities have a more like appropriate um, role in. Uh, now, certainly, SDL. What SDL is saying is that e ultimately, at the end of the day, the management of these entities would be localized. It's just kind of a matter of almost like where you get the funding and the minimum uh, regulations from. And so uh, certainly I would say that something like a headcount model sort of tax subsidy scheme for cities, but where the funding comes from the state level wouldn't necessarily be the worst thing. But like Micah said, it's going to depend on the politics of, of your state strategically, unfortunately, because if we had such a model in Texas, well, I mean, what would happen? Right. Yeah, sure. We, we, we be, would just yeah, be cut to shit. It would be <laughs> yeah. cut to shit. And it, our public transit would get a lot worse across the whole state. I mean, goodness, like we had the, the state, the state of Texas, um, this kind of got swept under the rug. But there was the Death Star bill, uh, which I, I, I believe was actually passed. But it, I believe it's under court review right now. And the reason it was called the Death Star bill was because Texas uh, Republicans basically authored a bill, which basically said that um, the spirit of the bill was that Cities cannot propose regulations that the state has also proposed regulations for, which basically means cities can't propose any regulation because the bill literally says the city city, the scope of city regulation cannot include economic policy <laughs> like that was what nice. and it's like. Good God! <laughs> you basically just. Well, fortunately, there are so many policies which do not affect economic behavior, right? Like the broad <laughs> yeah. swath of policies is what remains city power for. Yeah, exactly. So you know, yeah, state politics plays a role in 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 um in your 
your de- your ultimate decision there, uh, I, I would say. I, so. so in particular, I brought it up because I've been thinking about it in terms of, of policing, where a state-level civilian oversight board seems almost certainly more likely to have more power than local civilian oversight boards, just for the same reasons that local city councilors are going to be disrepresentative. Um, there's actually evidence on this that like local elections lean conservative, they lean older, they lean whiter. And that's part of the reason that our policies in this country are more conservative on crime than the average person desires. Like Because of that bias... Is, is part of the reason we have like a more severe criminal system than we would otherwise want. Um, and so, you know, I, I, it's just hard not to think, you know, we, everyone pays taxes and some of those taxes go to state highway funds. And, you know, we don't all pay gas taxes. We don't all pay carbon taxes, but we do all pay money to go to the highway fund. Why is it that only a city can charge fees to go for its system infrastructure. It seems like these should just all be paid for by everyone because these benefit everyone. Infrastructure benefits everyone, right? Every city person who doesn't have to buy a car is a little bit less road funding that some guy out in the sticks doesn't have to pay for. So everyone should benefit I, I think, in the system. I think, I think intercity transit should definitely um, receive state support. Um, and I think that relating to the police, um, yeah, it's definitely civilian oversight sounds good. Uh, state level police forces sounds incredibly scary. I, but I want why? The, guys with guns. the, the I want local the guys. police forces are already scary and insane, right? <laughs> like you want you want the guys with guns to be as decentralized as possible. Um, the threat of fascism is much higher whenever a one crazy governor like Greg Abbott can say, actually, all the police in the state are now going to be mobilized for this agenda. You know, a lot of the really bad bills that have been passed by the Texas legislature are not being enforced in many cities because they don't have control over our police, and so our police won't enforce them. Right. It's only state level police and then state police, which do exist, um, which are enforcing these completely awful laws. And so if all police were state police, we'd have a lot more enforcement of these bad things. Right. I mean, I, I think you're like basically I think you're right, but it, it always seems to be the case that you're right because the people who have the power will be using it for like awful, terrible reasons. But in any country that's like in any state that's left of like the the center in this country it just seems like there's a huge problem with local police forces refusing to do their jobs um there there's been a so uh, have you seen graphs of traffic citations in um san francisco for example or los angeles i forget which one yeah it's no. like they've collapsed after covid or something it, like nobody it, gets it's something tickets. like Yes, it's something there's there's like 1% as many speeding tickets today as there were four years ago, which is ridiculous. You know, the drivers in California have not become 99% better overnight. They're not all self-driving cars. It's ridiculous. It's just cops not doing their jobs because they don't agree with the local laws. So it's sort of the reverse. Um, it's that cops are actively refusing to participate in laws they don't agree with. And there's to some degree, you know, you can argue there's a Democrat element to that um, of refusing to participate in unjust laws. But there's also a degree to which like, you have to do your job and arrest people who are just like killing people with, with reckless driving. Um, and it seems like that's less of a problem when you have the ability. Let me give one more interesting example of why this matters. Um, in a lot of states, there is no central record of who has been a cop. Um, and so what happens is some guy gets fired from one department because he beat up someone or he violated the, the nature of his role. And then he just goes to another department and he's like, yep, I have cop experience. They're not going to recommend me, but I got a lot of experience in the job. And I hear you're really desperate for new cops. They'll usually go out to like a rural place where there isn't a great job market and they'll get hired. And so you have these terrible cops just constantly cycling through the system. And you don't have a way just to be like, no, you, you beat people up. You don't get to have that power anymore. I don't know. Well, yeah, well I, I do think I, that's why I said, like, I think like centralized accountability um, seems like that's like pretty not scary. Um, centralized administration in like actual command structure seems to just like increase fascism risk so much so that like kind of any sort of efficiency benefits or like really anything else is completely offset right uh, because you know the threat of authoritarian you know a, a republican governor going uh, haywire and just tr- deciding to use the police to enforce their entire awful agenda is just so much worse than any sort of benefit i think that could ever offer right yeah i, I and again i i guess um uh, part of a ultimately one of the big arguments on this show fundamentally is sort of the capacity for good that the American government has, right? Um, like this was one of our arguments that we had on state enterprise in general, right? Was that it's like, well, a, a resonant argument from Micah, like one of the arguments that SDL and I made on state enterprise in general was that, well, it really depends on the model of a state enterprise that gets proposed, right? Because some state enterprise models are good, some are bad. There's a lot of sort of heterogeneity in the data, you know, 
your, your sample really matters. And some states seem to be able to do state enterprise well. Some states seem to not be able to do it very well. But at the same time, it's like the theoretical optimal state enterprise proposal exists, and you could propose that in America, and it would work. But in actually existing America, <laughs> would such a proposal work? And so in actually existing Texas, would such a proposal work? Probably not, but maybe in actually sure. existing Maryland, it would work, right? So, um, you know, it, it's a, it's a, because public transit is a hyper localized policy, I mean, outside of sort of federal subsidies and maybe grants for things like this, um, th this is the calculus that we need to make. Um, but anyway, back to the topic of should public transit be free at the point of service? It sounds like what we generally uh, agree on, and I'm not sure if there's much more to talk about uh, besides what we've already mentioned. What we generally agree on is that. Uh, low cost, high exemption sort of public transit is kind of where we all sit at a minimum. And perhaps it is the case that once we have quality public transit, and perhaps when we have a more wonky tax system with things like congestion pricing and you know carbon taxes and things like this, um, that maybe at that point, it makes a lot more sense to make it fully free. Uh, and maybe in certain cities with high quality public transit, maybe in DC or New York or you know whatever we think when we, when we think of cities in America with good public transit, maybe in those cities it does make sense just to go ahead and make it free.